Just like any profession, sound engineers have a set of tools to get the job done. Those tools are our equalizers, compressors, reverb and delay units, gates, expanders, and the many other processors that you may find in a modern digital audio workstation. But knowing what tools you have in your arsenal is not even half the battle. Knowing how to use these tools and understanding everything that they are capable of is what helps to make a versatile and efficient engineer. So in this series, I aim to provide in-depth tutorials on the functions and techniques of these processors to help you create more professional and interesting mixes. In this episode of Advanced Processing Tutorials, we are going to take a look at how to sculpt the frequency spectrum and really go in depth about the purpose of EQ. Now I did some research into what others think about how to sculpt the frequency spectrum and if it's even really necessary to do so. A lot of people seem to think that if you really spend time on choosing the right microphones and correct microphone placement, sculpting the frequency spectrum with EQ should not really even be necessary. And you know, I think this is also correct to a degree, because even though you are separating the frequency content of each element, you are also drastically affecting the original nature of the instrument in the mix. So before we start talking about the workflow, I want you to understand that this is not always a tactic to use while mixing, but there are a few scenarios that stick out in my mind where this will be helpful. The strategy will almost always be useful to some degree when mixing electronic music. The reason for this is because the instruments are already computer generated and you are not trying to reproduce the sound of a live instrumental performance, so making many EQ adjustments will simply help to separate the elements in a mix. The next scenario is for when the instruments were not optimally recorded. This can mean a lot of things. It can mean that there was bad mic placement, poor room acoustics, or even a limited microphone selection. The reason why I say this is a time to use frequency sculpting is because the instruments have already gone through some harmful coloration to the point where they simply do not sound accurately reproduced, and all the frequency sculpting can do is once again give them their own sonic space. Now, if you happen to have a great sounding room, a nice microphone selection, and the time and knowledge to place them correctly, frequency sculpting will probably not be necessary and could even be potentially harmful for your mix. So hopefully I cleared that up, and you understand that this is more or less a technique to help fix a problem rather than to enhance a mix. And now that I got that out of the way, I want to talk to you about my workflow for sculpting the frequency spectrum. The workflow is important here, as you can probably assume that every mix is going to have a different frequency content and different EQ adjustments, so we will focus more on the process than any specific actions. The first thing to note while sculpting the frequency spectrum is that you want to EQ as much as possible while listening to the whole entire mix. When you EQ a soloed instrument, you do not hear how it interacts with the other elements, and even though an adjustment might sound good by itself, it may not in relation to the complete mix. So always try to make adjustments while listening to the whole thing. It will also be beneficial to train your ears by focusing on certain ranges of the frequency spectrum while others are still present. The next thing to keep in mind is that I personally like to EQ based on a frequency range instead of mixing instrument to instrument. What I mean by this, and I'll give you an example shortly, is that instead of EQing the full spectrum of an instrument at one time, just pick a range of frequencies for the whole entire mix. For example, I will usually start by listening to 40 to 120 hertz, and I'll make the adjustments for the entire mix for this specific frequency range. Once I go through every instrument at that frequency range, then I'll start listening to, say, 130 hertz to 600 hertz, and once again, listen to every element in the mix at that specific frequency range. The reason why I do this is because you want to work with small increments of frequency. If you do the full spectrum from 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz for each instrument, you will most likely find yourself having to go back and make adjustments to a previous instrument, which will in turn mess up the balance between the other instruments as well, and it kind of cycles from there. So if you sculpt one frequency range at a time, it becomes a lot easier to organize and know that everything is in its correct place. Alright, so now we can actually start making the adjustments. We know that this whole process is to essentially fix a problem, so when it comes to adjusting the EQ, we want to cut before we boost. We want to get rid of the bad frequencies before we enhance the good ones. Finding harmful frequencies is actually quite easy, if you do not have a highly trained ear that can just pick out where they are. I call this technique sweeping. What you need to do is set your Q control to the smallest band available so that it affects the least amount of frequencies, and then boost it as high as it can go and start slowly sweeping it through the frequency range that you are working on. This should reveal any really bad frequencies, and once you find them, simply cut them out. If it seems like there are multiple frequencies in that same area, then simply widen the Q. Do this for each instrument for every new frequency range, and now you have begun to sculpt your spectrum by ridding it of all these nasty harmful frequencies and making room for the good ones. 
To make a certain element stand out from another, you need to have different frequency content. The common example in the lowest range, 40 to 120 hertz, is the battle between the kick drum and the bass guitar. To let both of these elements stand out on their own, you need to decide which one will have the lower fundamental frequency. A lot of people tend to automatically have an opinion on this, but just like anything in the skill, you should really use your ears. Not all bass guitars sound the same, and almost all kick drums sound different. So before you decide which element will go where, I'd always take a good listen to both and analyze their natural frequency content and decide which one will benefit more from the real low frequencies and which one will give the mix more power. For the purpose of this video, let's say the kick benefits greatly from these low frequencies. What I would then do is find out where it gets a lot of the power by using the sweeping method I mentioned earlier and boosting that frequency to taste, then cutting the same frequency a bit on the bass guitar so that they have some sonic space. Then I would try and find a higher frequency in the bass that still sounds good and gives it power, boost that, and then cut the frequency a bit in the kick. This way you are designating frequencies for each instrument and the frequency content is not cluttered. It is really important that you make sure the content you are boosting helps to enhance the natural sound of the element. If you just boost any random frequencies without having a reason, you are doing more harm than good and you would be better off simply not EQing it at all. So always use your ears and have a reason to your decisions. For this low frequency range, you usually do not have too many instruments to EQ. A lot of main elements like keyboard, guitar, and vocals will have a high pass filter on them past this 120 points anyways to make even more room for these low frequency elements. However, the next frequency range that you work on will start to get significantly more complicated as you add many more of these elements into the mix. So this next range of frequencies is actually pretty important. I like to think of this range to be from around 150 to 500 hertz, and there's a lot going on in this range. It is where all of the elements in your mix are now present but it's the low end of all of these elements. So it can get real messy pretty quick. The bass guitar usually has a lot of muddiness from around 200 to 300 hertz, and the kick has a lot of boxiness from 3 to 500 hertz. And on top of this, you're introducing the fundamental frequencies of all the other elements in your mix. So this range is sometimes hard to manage. However, still use the same workflow, use your sweeps, cut before you boost, and make sure you're not sculpting just to make room, but to enhance the good and diminish the bad. One tip to keep in mind for this range of frequencies is to make sure you have enough bands to work with. Think about making a lot of small cuts and small boosts instead of a few large ones. I even sometimes load up a whole new instance of the EQ just for this specific frequency spectrum. This is the part of the spectrum that I spend the most time on as it can be the most detrimental to the clarity of the mix. Moving forward, I'm going to just give you some little tips that I've realized about each frequency range because the workflow stays the same. The next frequency range that I usually use is around 500Hz to 2.5K Hz. And in this range you get the bulk of the lead instruments. This is also what the human ear hears most naturally. So what you do EQ here will actually be the most notable. Keep the same workflow in mind, but maybe try and make smaller boosts and cuts or find an EQ that has a little less coloration. Also think about broader band adjustments for this range of frequencies. Tight adjustments are simply more noticeable and that is really what you want to avoid when it comes to this particular range of frequencies. Moving up to what will be the last band of frequencies that I mentioned, which is 2.5 kHz to 10 kHz. The reason why I'm not really going to talk about 10 kHz and beyond is because frequencies in this range will not really affect the clarity of your mix. They still may be necessary to boost or cut, but there's not a lot regarding interference and the diminishing of clarity when it comes to these frequencies. Even with the higher frequencies in this last range that I'm going to talk about, really focusing on around 2.5 kHz to 6 kHz is the area where you need to continue to sculpt. Boost where others are cut and cut where others are boosted. Otherwise, this area should have mostly small tight adjustments to fix any harmful frequencies. Although, keep in mind, this is also where the airiness of the mix will be. This is where the life of the mix is, and it allows it to breathe. So really try to not make as many adjustments in this range. So hopefully this video has played out the general workflow of sculpting the frequency spectrum, when you should do it, and the frequency ranges that you should primarily focus on. Let me know in the comments section if this was helpful, if you do it, or why you think you should avoid this technique in general. I've definitely found this technique to be hit or miss, and just recently I realized why it works well sometimes and then others it doesn't. Anyways, I'm going to wrap up the video here and I hope this provided some insight into this process.
I hope everyone is having a great day and I will see you in the next video.